The U.S. interstate system is one of the most complex and important facets of American transportation. In today's video, I'm going to be explaining the history and creation of the interstate system, along with delving into its current state, and, because each topic has two sides, identifying some of the positives and negatives that the federal interstate highway system has created. Before I get started, my name is Felix, and I make a bunch of videos about random topics that range anywhere from travel to politics, so if you find this video enjoyable or informative, I would highly appreciate if you could give it a like and subscribe. Also, as I recently went on a wonderful cross-country road trip, I'll be using footage from various highways in a number of states. Now, without further delay, let's talk the interstate. The federal government of the United States has a long history of supporting road construction. The first instance of this road building support came in the Federal Aid Road Act of 1916, which provided subsidies for creating roads during the craze of the Ford Model T. Then, the first time we saw a concerted effort to create a national highway system came in the Federal Aid Act of 1921, and five years later, the highway numbering system was established, which created the first organized system that made traveling across the country an easier process. This numbering system can still be seen in effect with the roads that featured a white shield on a black background and are most commonly known as U.S. routes or U.S. highways. These U.S. highways didn't have a consistent standard and were still maintained and funded by individual states. They could range anywhere from a shabby dirt or gravel country road to a wide city boulevard. Thus, a better idea needed to be put in place. The first concept of the interstate system came in a report to Congress named Toll Roads and Free Roads, which was delivered in 1939. While these ideas laid the basis of what would later become the interstate system, a number of larger global issues <clears throat> World War II, the Korean War, and the start of the Cold War inevitably delayed any true action taken to build highways. This was until President Dwight D. Eisenhower came into office in 1953. As a man with a strong military background, Eisenhower, who had played a pivotal role as the Allied General in Germany, observed the Autobahn highway system in that country. Also, compared to his earlier career experiences, where he saw the inefficiency and delay of the previous American road system, Eisenhower, inspired from his experiences abroad along with his understanding of the likely civilian and military benefits of such a system, decided to push for a national highway. Obviously, the civilian benefits, which I'll get into more depth later, were evident as the system was believed to be able to encourage easier transportation of goods and ideas and allow cities and suburbs to grow. Military benefits during the contentious Cold War period were obvious as well. The system was ultimately named the National System of Interstate and Defense Highways, which points to the purpose of constructing the roads. Wide, accessible, and fast highways could be used to efficiently move military equipment, troops, and civilians if such emergency situations were necessary. While the federal government was instrumental in helping to fund and plan the interstate system, and continues to do so to this day, the sections of highway are actually owned by the individual states. In order to come to agreement with House Democrats, Eisenhower ultimately agreed to a gasoline tax as a way to avoid funding the Highway Act through the sale of public bonds. In the act, it was also outlined that the federal government would pay for 90% of all the construction costs of interstate highways. Very importantly, all highways need to have at least four total lanes, that's two lanes going each way, and no crossings. This meant that getting on or off a highway would need to be done by a ramp or some other type of mechanism, not through an intersection with any lights or stop signs. While speed limits initially weren't as high as current standards, Nowadays in rural areas, you'll find speed limits anywhere from 65 to 80 miles per hour, that's 105 to 130 kilometers per hour, and 35 to 65 miles per hour, or 55 to 105 kilometers per hour, in more urban areas, depending on circumstances. Interstates, which were primarily constructed between the 60s and 90s in a building craze, were mostly new roads built from scratch. But sometimes, they were also built on the foundations of old roads, such as construction over the old Route 66 in Missouri, a road which I will also make a video about, and I-76 in Pennsylvania, which already existed before the interstate system. To the tune of $114 billion, or roughly $550 billion in current dollars, and across 35 years, the project was finally proclaimed finished in 1992. Naming the roads of the interstate system was another challenge in itself, mostly due to the presence of the previously mentioned U.S. highway system. Interstates were designated with the now iconic red, white, and blue shields. 
major interstates are either one or two digit numbers, with routes running from north to south or vice versa depending on how you think about it, containing odd numbers, and routes running from east to west designated after even numbers. Unlike the US highway system, where the smallest number started on the east coast with Route 1, to avoid confusion, north to south interstate routes started with the smallest number, Interstate 5, along the west coast. From there, increments of these major north to south highways would go up by 10, with Interstate 15 being second to the west, and so on and so forth until you reach Interstate 95 on the east coast. Similarly, the smallest west to east route starts in the south, with the major Interstate 10 being built pretty close to the southern border. And then, as you can imagine, Interstate 90 runs close to the northern border, with highway numbers in increments of 10 in between. Sometimes highways will also run concurrently. For example, between Gary, Indiana and Elyria, Ohio, I-80 and I-90 run on the exact same roadway before diverging at either end. This is because both are major numbered highways, and while I-90 would typically be built further north than I-80, the size of the Great Lakes pushes it down south, where it meets I-80, and they run together for a period of time. For smaller interstates, or interstates that were later added into the system, the numbers typically reflect their position in relation to other large highways. Therefore, Interstate 76, which I had mentioned before, gets its name because it's located between I-70 and I-80. Interestingly enough, while major highway numbers cannot be repeated, these smaller ones can be. For example, there is one Interstate 76 that runs through Pennsylvania and Ohio, and another that runs through Colorado. Another example of this is I-87. That is an interstate highway that runs in between I-85 and I-95, and it has sections in both New York and North Carolina. As long as the two sections are geographically far enough, they can share the exact same name. As you might observe, other interstate highways are named with not one or two numbers, but three instead. These three-digit numberings are typically found near metropolitan regions and are named after a parent highway that they are built off of. They are also known as auxiliary highways. Three-digit interstate highways that start with an even number, like 280 or 610, are typically routes that loop around or bypass a city, and have two or more connecting points to the major interstate that they are named around. Meanwhile, three-digit interstates that start with the odd number are typically spur or connector highways, those that may go off a major highway and deposit drivers into a city, for example, without ever connecting to another highway. Being that most major cities have a number of interstate highways built around them, these numbers can be recycled as long as they don't repeat in the same state. It is for this reason that you will find seven different I-395s around the whole country. But you can see how this system can get messy. There are certain highways that are built off other spurs, three-digit highways built off other three-digit highways. And in other cases, in large states such as California, a lack of possible names has led to the creation of I-238, a number that doesn't at all follow any naming conventions. While highways do their best to follow the complicated ruling system that I've outlined, look hard enough and you'll find a number of exceptions to the rule. Let's also not forget about Hawaii, Alaska, and Puerto Rico. All three of these territories have roads that were constructed under the Federal Highway Act, yet none of them have any land connections to the rest of the US. In Hawaii, interstate names begin with H, Alaska A, in Puerto Rico, PR. The numbering is also easier to remember. For example, Hawaii's first interstate is H1, their second H2, and their third H3. The numbers just simply ascend like that. Alaska is another curious example as it's the only interstate highway that I personally know of where the highways do not follow the four lanes, no intersections rule that I outlined before. The fascinating highways in this system are sometimes pretty narrow two-lane roads without a solid median or a large shoulder, and they often intersect with other roads as stop signs. These roads would also be quite dangerous for large vehicles to drive through due to their proximity to rivers, cliffs, and mountains. They are very beautiful drives though, and I can say from personal visitation that the roads are in quite good shape. You'll also find certain interstates, we'll use I-80 as an example, with business routes. Business routes, seen with a green shield, are roads that don't necessarily comply with interstate standards, but are close by to a major interstate and travel through the downtown area of a town or village. 
Personally, I've seen them more in smaller and more rural towns and cities, and there are ways to incentivize people to go off the main highway to check out some local businesses. Next, let's talk about the exit system. Exits on the highway system are numbered after the nearest mile marker, with the miles resetting in every new state entered. If there are two exits with the same closest mile marker, they'll be named exits number, let's say 121, they would be 121A, 121B, and in some extreme cases, C, D, or even E. While most interstate exits are numbered with the mile marker in mind, other times they will simply be sequential. For example, in a state, you might find exits 1, 2, 3, and 4, regardless of the distance that they are set at. And in one very odd example, I-19 in Arizona, the interstate exits are actually based on kilometers, the reason being that kilometers are more accessible to Mexican tourists. Now, after that long and overly complex explanation of the highway naming system, let's talk about some of the controversy of the Federal Highway Act and interstate system. It was not until 2018, for example, that I-95 was finally made continuous in Pennsylvania, actually very close to where I live. I-70 is still not continuous despite being a so-called major highway. The reasoning for the delay behind both of these mega projects was citizen lobbying, and you can certainly understand their perspective. First of all, nobody wants a noisy highway running through the backyard. And highways do cause a severe amount of noise, pollution, and other troubles for residents. Worse yet, some residents would be forced out of their properties through eminent domain, which is the government ability to purchase private land for public projects. Furthermore, the creation of the interstate was not good news for a lot of business owners. The creation of these faster and more isolated highways meant that it really wasn't about the journey anymore, but more about the destination. While big cities would likely see more business and travel, small towns and midway stops such as motels, gas stations, or funky roadside attractions or gift shops would see less people coming to them. It was, in fact, the interstate system that is attributed for much of the decline for tourism along stops on Route 66, which has led to many abandoned and bankrupt businesses. While there were those who were affluent enough to lobby for interstate highways to not be built or to be redirected, there were individuals on the other side of the coin as well. Poor people in cities, often people of color, were most frequently the loser in the creation of the interstate system. In many cases, because these individuals didn't have the socio-economic power to protest the actions of government agencies, highways were built right through the communities, creating severe displacement. With the creation of highways also came the concept of many wealthy individuals leaving cities to suburbs. It was the interstate system that enabled the image of a white picket fence and lawn, as wealthier individuals were now able to commute their way to work in a city, while returning to home half an hour to an hour away. As you can probably understand, the departure of wealthy individuals from cities certainly did no favor to city tax revenue, which meant that cities had less funding for things like school, law enforcement, public work projects, infrastructure, and social programs, all of which disproportionately would hit the poor individuals who often did not have the proper resources, like a car, a stable job, or enough money to leave to the suburbs. As you can imagine, all of these factors combined with the fact that highways are kind of a physical barrier in certain circumstances has contributed to many poor urban neighborhoods becoming much worse off. Also, since spending was put so much into car culture and building these highways, public transportation investment was lowered. That's why so much of the US has inadequate subway, tram, bus, or train service, which helped move people around and can really provide opportunities for poor individuals. As you can see, all of these factors combined certainly have been influential in the stagnation of people being able to move around economic classes. Despite some of the negativity that I've been pushing, I'm still personally very grateful for the interstate system. It's a tremendous infrastructure network that is integral to moving people, goods, and ideas around the country, and to be honest, I don't know if a current government could pull it off. In natural fashion, of course, the original budget was still blown over by 300% during the time period, so I just don't want to imagine how it looked now. While I really appreciate the interstate system, there are certainly many flaws in its design. Like I mentioned before, poor individuals, mostly African Americans, often were the losers of such a design. And more than that, highways are an ugly feature that I personally believe don't belong in the downtown of big cities, where commerce, parks, and residential buildings should belong. 
Highways make it difficult for pedestrians or bikers in many major cities, and also have stunted the development of public transportation. As somebody who has personally been fortunate and privileged enough to travel to Asia and Europe, I can tell you how convenient and important that a strong public transit system is. The car reliance that our culture has developed has harmed many cities like Los Angeles and Washington DC, where traffic on interstates can be absolutely disastrous and unbearable, and can be quite an eyesore and physical barrier to otherwise beautiful cities. In other cases, they have harmed successful businesses or torn apart historic districts. For example, can you believe that initially a highway was built on the Embarcadero in San Francisco? It tore apart a vibrant waterfront district that is now popular for locals and tourists alike thanks to its eventual destruction through an earthquake. The impact of highways have already been exhibited in Seattle, where access to the water was long blocked off by the Alaskan Way Viaduct, which has only recently been rectified. I believe that a truly great highway system connects different cities, but goes around or deposits people into cities instead of going through cities. But what are your thoughts on the interstate highway system? Are you for it? Against it? Or do you hold a conflicted position like I do? Let me know down below in the comments. And if you found this video informative or interesting, be sure to like and subscribe, and until next time, have a great day.